We're still in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, two weeks ago. Our text was verses 13 through 27. Last week, it was verses 28 through 35, which concluded what most people think of as the story of the road to Emmaus. But it's easy to imagine our reading today, verses 36 through 43, as being a kind of a postscript to that story. So let us open our hearts to the reading of God's word. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and they thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. This is the word of God. Let me, let us pray. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them, and take our hearts and set them on fire for a love for your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. For the last two weeks now, we've been looking at the events of, that occurred on Easter on the road to Emmaus. Two weeks ago, we followed Cleopas and another disciple of Christ who were sad and discouraged as they walked down the road because Jesus had been crucified. When a stranger began to walk with them, they did not recognize that this was the risen Lord who walks with us through our disappointments. Last week, we watched as the three men sat down at table. When the stranger took bread, blessed and broke and gave it to the the men, their eyes were open just as our eyes are open when receiving the sacrament of communion as we will be receiving today. Immediately after they recognized him, Jesus vanished. And immediately Cleopas and the other disciple went back to Jerusalem. They returned to the upper room where they found everyone talking about the appearance of Jesus to Peter as well. So today's text tells us that while they were discussing all this, Jesus himself himself stood amongst them and said, Shalom, peace be with you. And the disciples were terrified thinking that they had seen a ghost. Now, it's interesting that Cleopas and his companion did not believe Jesus was risen from the dead because they did not see him. The rest of the disciples didn't believe because they did see him. In other words, they didn't believe their own eyes. You know, wouldn't you have loved to have been in the upper room that day? I mean, haven't you ever thought that, gee, if only I could have been there, if only I could have seen the risen Lord with my own eyes, that would be great because then I wouldn't need faith. Seeing is believing, we say. But I wonder if that's true. I don't think, I'm not sure that we believe what we see. I wonder if it would be more fair to say that we see what we believe. If you 
believe your your boss, your teacher, or your spouse is not good enough, it doesn't matter what they do, you will only see the flaws in their life. If you believe that Jesus is dead, it wouldn't matter if you were looking right at him. You would still have your doubts. Now, at first, Jesus tries to prove that he is real to his disciples. Why do doubts arise in your heart, he says. Look at my hands and my feet, which, of course, still bore the mark of the nails. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bone. But we were told that they disbelieved for joy. A a fascinating turn of words. They disbelieved for joy. Such a remarkable line. The text reads, well, in their joy, they were disbelieving. This this belief thing has never been easy, yet sometimes I suspect we seek it for the wrong reasons. Jacques Ellul writes, belief is reassuring. People who live in the world of belief feel safe. On the contrary, faith is forever placing us on the razor's edge. Sometimes people have a hard time believing because something terrible has happened and they wonder how a good God could have allowed that. But more often the stumbling block to true belief is our joy. We we just don't trust it. Joy seems to be fleeting, as as vaporous, as unreliable as a ghost. It seems too good to be true. Every life has moments of fleeting, intense joy, such as a, a wedding or a graduation day or the day that a child is born. Likewise, every life has moments of intense grief such as the day a loved one dies or the day an awful disease is found in your body. But most of our life is spent neither on the mountaintops nor in the dark valleys. Most of our life is spent in the flat plains of ordinary days. Your relationships are okay. Your job, your your health is okay, your your life is okay. It's in these long moments when life is ordinary that a nagging voice from deep within emerges to say, is that all there is? Am I really happy? Things aren't awful. You're, You're just vaguely dissatisfied with your life. Something is missing. And somehow life just hasn't turned out to be as amazing as you expected. The last savior you were counting on has died like all the others. And the familiar dreariness of the ordinary has triumphed again. You can cope with this discontent by working a little harder for a promotion. You can do a little more shopping, buy the iPhone 14 Pro Max or a Fitbit that will promise to fix everything. But in your soul, you know that you are just rearranging the ordinary. If any joy comes from these things, you expect that it too will be fleeting. So when Easter tide and, and the church proclaims Jesus is risen from the dead, everything is different. If, if you're honest, you're, you're tempted to say, Man, I just don't, don't see it. Maybe it will help you with the ticket to heaven or maybe the big crises in your life. But what can Easter do about our greatest challenge, the routine. 
that is what resurrection really should be all about, transforming the ordinary into extraordinary moments of joy. It should be more than claiming that Christians have a faith story that is cooler than other religions. What does resurrection have to do with our ordinary lives? Realizing that he was getting nowhere trying to prove that he was really risen from the dead, that it was pointless to keep on pointing to his flesh and bones since none of the disciples were going to believe their eyes, Jesus simply shrugs and says, have you got anything to eat? Now, at first, this appears to be something of a non sequitur. You can imagine that the disciples are now having a hard time believing their ears. Do we have anything to eat? But someone finds a piece of leftover broiled fish, and so Jesus sits down and eats, quote, in their presence. Now, this is anything but a throwaway line in the Bible. This is, in some respects, the goal of the resurrection. As Jesus said after this meal, everything written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms has been fulfilled. Now, it all, it all comes together over a very ordinary piece of broiled fish and I believe you could argue that this is more significant than any proof of the bodily resurrection. That is, Jesus in our ordinary presence. When Jesus appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus, their eyes were opened by a sacramental act of breaking and giving bread. He was known to them in the breaking of bread as we will be doing today. But when he appears to the rest of the disciples in the upper room, their eyes were opened by the sacramentalizing, if that's a word, of simply a common meal. If you believed, you too would see that his presence with you makes everything holy just as holy as the communion that we're about to receive today. You know, we speak these days about the difference between secular and sacred. Church, we claim, is sacred. Work is secular. Maybe we even like to maintain those distinctions because it, it's convenient to live differently at work than we do at church. But the Bible knows that there is no such distinction. It claims that the whole world belongs to God, the creator, who in Christ has redeemed all things, in whom all things are held together. The biblical distinction is not between secular and sacred. The biblical distinction is between sacred and profane. All things have a sacred purpose, but anything can be sacred or can be profaned by distorting its purpose. You can profane a word, sexuality, money, or work, or you can see its holy purpose. Nothing is more profane than removing the ordinary from the purposes of Christ. Teilhard de Chardins said, nothing here below is profane for those who know how to see. On the contrary, everything is sacred. Do not limit the work of Christ simply to matters of the spirit. Because the bodily resurrection of Christ affirms that spirit and body, joy 
and routine, miracle and ordinary, can never be separated. The bodily resurrection claims that Jesus cares about bodies that do not work, bodies that are in need of exercise, bodies that are hungry and homeless and tortured, and bodies of all those who are alone and feel like a nobody. It's all, it's all a spiritual issue. And so are your routines. If eating broiled fish is a spiritual exercise, then nothing in the world that is void of the, nothing in the world is void of the presence of Christ. When mothers spend their days in minivans running errands, Christ is present in the minivan. When you spend your days going between one doctor's appointment and the lab, Christ is with you. If you believed, you would see that. If you saw that, it would change your perspective on all that going to and fro, the ordinary would become extraordinary because Jesus is going with you to the grocery store. Jesus is with you as you wipe the noses of your grandkids and continue your busyness until you fall asleep exhausted at the end of another long day. When students knock themselves out to get the grade, Jesus is there. He's with them as they trudge off to the library, as they stay up all night trying to get their lab report to work, as they call home and explain that they're going to be changing their major. When you're considering moving into a retirement community, Jesus is there. He got to the admissions counselor before you did. But the question is, did you see him? Are you even looking for Jesus in the presence of your very ordinary daily activities? Children sometimes understand how to do this much better than adults because they have not yet starved all the mystery out of the world. In a child's world, an ugly duckling can become a swan, an unwanted stepsister can become a princess, and a frog can become a prince. You just don't know. You have to kiss him and find out. They understand Jesus being with them at the funeral home. Ruth Haley Barton writes that if we are not comfortable with mystery, we are not comfortable with the very gospel that we proclaim. So I ask, can we learn to embrace that mystery? Do you see the risen Christ has restored the mysterious presence of God in all of life. Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of thy glory. And this means that anything can happen, not even the routine is routine. So the secret to living in the ordinary is not to climb out of it for a fleeting moment of joy, but to find abiding joy in the mystery that lies within the ordinary. This is the secret of ordinary joy. And the secret to finding that mystery after Easter isn't much of a mystery at all. It's there in plain sight that you just have to choose to believe to see it. 
Amen.